Last week, you realize or recognize, I'm sure, that we began a new series in the book of Philemon. We've been going through the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul, and we took some time to go through the book of Ephesians. We spent a lot of time going through that, and then we followed that up by looking at the book of Colossians. And during that particular imprisonment, the Apostle Paul also wrote the book of Philemon. And it's interesting to call it a book because Philemon is it's primarily a, a one-page letter that was written to an individual. And uh, last week, we looked at the first seven verses of the book of Philemon. And today, we're going to be looking at verses 8, 9, and 10. So just three verses, really, that we'll be looking at today. But as we look at this, what you're going to see in Philemon, starting with verse 8, is that the Apostle Paul illustrates what it looks like to get bolder as you get older. As you're growing older, I think that there's a way, a Christ-honoring way, that we could become a bit bolder. And you're going to see that in the words that the Apostle Paul shares as he addresses some of these things with Philemon. So if you would take your Bibles and turn there with me, Philemon, and we're going we're to pick up at verse 8, and this is what it says. Paul says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to spend some time together this morning looking at this portion of Scripture and meditating on all the things that you reveal to us in it. We know, Lord, that it's a brief portion of Scripture, but it illustrates some important things that you've called us to understand. Lord, as we walk with you over time, you inspire within us a righteous or a holy boldness that seems to develop and seems to come out of our lives the longer we walk with you. And so, Lord, as Paul illustrates how that's applied in this particular context, we pray that you give us your wisdom and your insight into how, how that can be applied in our context as well. And we thank you, Lord, for all of these things. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So she's downstairs right now, and I think she'll be coming back up momentarily. But later this week, my wife will be celebrating her birthday. So if you think of it, it's on Thursday. Um, she looks like she's many years younger than me, uh, even though she's a year older. And uh, I like to joke about that with her frequently, and thankfully she's a good sport, but, and this won't make me look good either, the fact that I just said that. I know that that makes me look bad. Uh, but a few weeks ago, I was actually talking with somebody about how old I was, and I realized that for the past few months, I've been giving people the wrong number. And it was a, just a genuine mistake, but I added a year to my age without realizing that I had done that. I was like, how did I do that? I added a year to my age. When I was a child, I actually remember um, adults pausing to think and do math when people would ask them how old they were. Do you remember that when you were a kid and how, how strange that seems to you at the time? You think, how could you not now how, know how old you are? That's one of the most important things to a child. And, and children grade things on half years and quarter years. And, and I remember when my children were like 11, they started referring to themselves as preteens. And so it's like, pre, you're 11, you're not a preteen. It's like, no, I'm a preteen. You're also pre-middle age. Do you want to call yourself pre-middle age? They would call them, you know, they never seemed to go with that designation. But I couldn't imagine losing track of my age when I was a child. And now that I'm a little older, I could definitely see how easily that mistake can be made because I recently made it. But as you grow older, what are some of the changes that you've noticed in yourself? And by the way, when you're answering that in your head, keep in mind I'm not talking about physical changes because that's too easy right? That's the one that we could all very easily go toward. We can start listing our aches and our pains and some of the things that have changed in that respect, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm actually, I'm actually talking about things that I, I think are internal and a, and a bit deeper than that. And what I mean is, what's changed? As you've grown older, what's changed about the nature of your spiritual faith over the course of your life? Or what's different about the ways in which you notice that you relate to people? Or how are your goals changing? Or what did you once think was important, but you no longer value the same way as you once did? Or what would you be will willing to say or do now that at an earlier season of life, you really wouldn't have said or you really wouldn't have done? When Paul wrote the letter that he wrote to Philemon, 
and he, he says this here, he considered himself to be an older man who had been seasoned by time and by trials and by other faith-stretching experiences. He possessed wisdom at this point. He possessed insight at this point. And, and it was wisdom and insight that when you look at what Scripture talks about him and, and how it describes him at an earlier season of life, these are things that he did not possess at that earlier season. But at this point now, the Lord had allowed him to see and experience and learn things that really took time to bear fruit in his life. And when Paul wrote this portion of Scripture, he demonstrated the kind of careful boldness, and I, I use that word very intentionally, or those words very intentionally, it's just like this careful boldness I think a spiritual person develops over time. What he demonstrates here in the way that he writes this, even though we're just looking at just a few verses of, of this letter today, but he, he demonstrates that he became bolder as he grew older, and he wanted to use that boldness in a particular way. He wasn't just trying to spout off opinions. What he was trying to do was to use that boldness in a Christ-honoring way to, to spread the gospel, to serve the church, and to inspire individual members of the church to take action as well. And I think there's a few ways that this gets illustrated to us when you look at this portion of Scripture. I think one of the things that he illustrates for us when you look at verse 8 is the fact that your confidence in Christ, as that grows, it should result in bold action. As your confidence in Christ grows, it should result in bold action. Let me reread verse 8 again. He says this. He says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, I'll read it again. He says, accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Have you ever been in a position where you were called upon to lead or teach somebody else? You know, we just honored our children's church workers and nursery workers this morning. Maybe some of you are part of that group. Maybe you, you, you've led or you taught in a different context. I think many of us find ourselves in that position uh, as parents or with children at home. And uh, you probably find yourself in that position every day where you're leading or you're teaching or you're guiding. One thing I've noticed about children, and this is pretty much most ages of children, children often question their parents' wisdom and they often question their parents' instruction. And I have to confess something to you that when I was a child, I frequently challenged my parents' directions. That was not an uncommon thing from me. After being told what to do, I would often reply, with a question like, why do I have to do that? Now, just imagine that. You know, picture nine-year-old me looking at my parents and being like, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? Picture 13-year-old me. Why do I have to do that? I, I don't even know how many times I said that phrase growing up, but it was, I'm sure it was plenty. And I would often receive the response that drove me nuts. What's the response that will drive you crazy as a child? If you're, That's right. Exactly. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it, right? Because I said so, and that would send me through the roof, because I said so. Now, ironically, the older I get, the more I realize that because I said so is an appropriate answer. <laughs> Even though it's probably wise to use it sparingly, I don't think that that should be your go-to all the time, but from time to time, because I said so actually is quite appropriate. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, like from the spiritual standpoint, my, my father and my mother were the primary authorities that the Lord had sovereignly placed over my life. That was his choice. He, you know, they had the right to tell me whatever they thought was in my best interest, and I should have listened. I had no right to question their authority, even though I often made the arrogant mistake of doing so. And I bring that personal example up because when you look at the context of the early church and you look at the Apostle Paul, Paul had spiritual authority over the people that he was addressing these letters to, particularly in this context, Philemon. And he could have executed that authority when speaking to Philemon. He could have pulled that card. And, and when you look at his authority, you can think about several ways that he had authority. Paul was an apostle. He was an apostle in the early church. Obviously, pretty high rank of spiritual authority. He was also a founding pastor in multiple churches. And he was a spiritual father to many people, Philemon being one of them. But Paul had also grown bold in Christ, and he could have commanded Philemon to do what he's about to ask him to do. Now, we're going to get into the details of what he's about to ask him to do in future weeks, and I'll allude to it some today, but he's about to make a big ask of Philemon, 
And he could have just, instead of making an ask, he could have just commanded it. He could have just said, this is how it has to be. And if Philemon said, well, why? Paul could have rightly said, because I said so. And he would have had the authority to say it that way, but that's not the approach he took. And typically, admittedly, if you're ever in a position of leadership, if you want to really lead, probably don't say that, right? That's probably not the best, especially if you're leading adults, probably not a good idea. And so Paul doesn't take that approach. Um, but what he's about to do is he's, he's about to make an ask of Philemon. He's going to ask Philemon to grant freedom, to grant a pardon to an escaped slave that Philemon once owned named Onesimus. Now, we'll get into that in future weeks in more detail, but when you look at what Paul's doing here, even though he doesn't just like get up in Philemon's face in this letter, what he does is he still takes a bold approach. And in fact, when you think about it, he very much could have resisted writing this letter, and he could have allowed the issues that existed between Philemon and Onesimus to just be things that remained unresolved and unaddressed. But Paul cared too much about these men to not, to not step in and help bring reconciliation where it could be brought. And when I observe Paul in this portion of Scripture, one of the things that I'm impressed by and something that definitely has an impact on me is I see an impressive demonstration of Christ-empowered confidence. Paul wasn't confident in himself. I'm not trying to encourage us today to be confident in and of ourselves. I think a lot of people go around this world strutting with confidence in themselves, which I think is really a form of false confidence. I would rather be confident in my omniscient, omnipotent Lord than confident in me. And Paul here is demonstrating Christ-empowered confidence. He was confident in Jesus. And that confidence in Jesus was inspiring him and motivating him to take bold action with a clear conscience. And so he's addressing something head on here. And so with that confidence, you have the Apostle Paul throughout the course of his ministry doing things like confronting sin. And then with that confidence that Christ was giving him, he also preached the gospel where governments were hostile to it. Paul also went into cities and planted churches with that confidence that Christ had lent to him. Paul also confidently traveled primarily by foot throughout Europe and Asia and, uh, and planted churches and trained leaders and did all the things that he was called to do. And in the midst of it, he also felt the need to say some hard things to friends, even though he knew he might be risking friendship with them as he chose to do so. And I look at a scripture like this, even though we're really just one verse deep into the brief section we're looking at today, but I think this scripture and those examples that you could see from the Apostle Paul's life when you look at his, you know, what scripture reveals to him about his, uh, about his life in general, I think it begs the question, how is your confidence in Christ contributing to bold action in your life? Just think about that for a second. How is your confidence in Christ contributing to bold action in your life? Are you willing to say bold things for the cause of Christ when he gives you the opportunity to do so? Are you willing to take bold actions for the glory of Christ so that you won't be counted among the slothful multitude of people that like to, they like the view so much from the bleachers, they never want to get out onto the field? And I look at the Apostle Paul, and he's not the type of guy to just sit in the bleachers and observe as life goes by. He's like, I'm, I'm somebody that's going to get in the midst of the action. And so his confidence in Christ resulted in bold action. And he would take bold action. And he looked at it and he thought, I am not trying to preserve my earthly life. I am not trying to preserve my comfort. I am not trying to preserve, uh, you know, just my safety in this world. I'm going to take bold action to do what's right. And I'm going to act as a man of conscience as the Lord inspires me to do so. And his confidence in Christ inspired bold action. And I think that's something that you and I can learn from as we observe what Paul's doing, even as, as he's choosing his words very selectively and the Holy Spirit's giving him the wisdom and direction to pen these things a particular way. You can see Paul being bold, maybe in a way that we didn't even expect him to be bold, even as he's writing this letter. But he goes on to demonstrate something else, and I think there's an application for us in this as well. And that's this, your wisdom in Christ, I think that's going to lead you to appeal to the conscience of others. And what I mean by that is this, if you're living as a person of conscience, you start trying to speak to the conscience of others, either through the demonstration 
of your life or the words that you choose or both. And in Philemon verse 9, Paul says it this way. He says, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Now, you probably, I, I would assume, at some point in your life have been in a position where you had to ask somebody to do something difficult. If you're in a position like that, would you prefer appealing to their conscience or making a demand? I know in my case, I would personally prefer to appeal to a conscience. But admittedly, not everybody's at a spot of spiritual maturity where that works. Scripture also talks about having a seared conscience. And if you have a seared conscience, appealing to a seared conscience might not actually be the type of thing that feels quite as effective. But when you're dealing with someone who demonstrates that their conscience can be effectively appealed to, I think that's often the wisest approach to take. And I think that's why the Apostle Paul was taking this approach with Philemon. Because when you look at Philemon's life and you look at the, the variety of things that Philemon was doing and how he was serving in the church context, he seemed like somebody who had a strong conscience. And so Paul chose to appeal to him. But have you ever found yourself in a spot where you take the approach to appeal to a conscience and you don't know ahead of time where it's really going to go because you don't even know the person that you're talking to? I actually, this is strange, but I thought of this again recently. I... Uh, I, I, you probably get telemarketing calls on your cell phone all the time like I do. And this actually happened a couple years ago. I was sitting here in the office and I got a call from a telemarketer, but I didn't know it was a telemarketer. For some reason, it didn't strike me immediately as a telemarketer. It was usually the type of call that I wouldn't answer. But in that moment, I decided to answer it. And so I, I, I answered my phone. I said, hello. And the woman on the other end started trying to, it, you know, basically like, pitch me on something and then sell me something or in, invite me to do something. And, I, and uh, I listened for a second and then I paused and I, I just said, I, I said, ma'am, do you believe in God? And she paused for a second and she said, yes. And I said, okay, well, you and I both know that you've been lying to me, right? And I, and I said, in fact, you've been calling people all day lying to them, haven't you? And she paused, and then she goes, yes, I have. And I, at that point, it was quiet for a second, and I said, okay, well, God wants us to be truthful. I said, he wants you to tell me the truth, he wants me to tell you the truth. And I, I said, I think it's time to stop lying, ma'am, don't you think? And she, quiet, got, it paused, she paused for a second, and then she very quietly said, yes. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> and then she softly hung up. And that was the end of the conversation. And I thought about it afterward, and that, that I, I wish every example would tell, I wish I would think to do that every time I get a telemarketing call. I don't know that it would necessarily work, but I remember that day thinking to myself, I feel like the Holy Spirit inspired the direction of that conversation. I'm convinced that he, that he, that he influenced me to answer the phone because I normally would not answer a call like that. Normally you can tell, and for some reason I, I felt like I couldn't tell. But I normally wouldn't have answered that. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was di directing some of the things that just kind of came to my mind to say to her. And when I look at what Paul's words include in this passage, I honestly feel like the Spirit is leading the ways that he chooses to address these glaring issues in Philemon's life. You could see the direction. You could see the Holy Spirit directing what Paul's saying. And the wisdom of Christ taught Paul that this was a good time and a good way to appeal to Philemon's conscience. And as Paul did so, one of the things I'll point out to you is that he did this in the most loving way possible. He, even when you look at how that verse starts, verse 9, he says, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. He's saying, look, I could be bossy, I can make demands. I don't really think I should do that in this context. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. So he does this the most loving way possible. He didn't berate Philemon. He didn't attempt to embarrass him. In fact, Paul had just spent a considerable portion of this letter, and we looked at it last week, but if you look at the opening verses, he spends a good chunk of this letter just listing all the different ways that he's appreciative of Philemon. 
and how grateful he was to see how the Lord was using his life and how the Lord was allowing him to sacrificially serve the church in the city of Colossae. But now Paul was about to make a tough request. And what he does here is he's, he's about to appeal to Philemon's sense of mercy and integrity as he's about to ask him to act on behalf of Onesimus. And when I look at this here, one, it, it kind of warms my heart to look at a portion of Scripture like this because this is not, culturally speaking, the way people tend to interact with one another. I think this is something that the Lord directs us to do, and it's very different than what I consider a cultural response to be. But I believe as followers of Christ, you and I are called to be people of conscience. Now, many people in this world actively attempt to squelch their conscience. That is not an uncommon thing in this world. But we're called to have soft hearts. We're called to have repentant spirits. We're called to have consciences that are sensitive to what's holy and sensitive to what's right. And that's something that the Lord inspires us to have. And so one of the things that I think is useful for us to wrestle with is how has the Lord been appealing to your conscience as he seeks to direct your life and guide your life? And also, you know, based on what the Lord speaks to us about, how does he want us to speak to others? How does he want us to address others? How does he want us to demonstrate the fact that we, he has made us people of conscience by appealing to the conscience of our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in moments like this? And I think as you and I grow, as our walk with the Lord matures, what ends up happening is over time as we apply the scripture to our day-to-day -day life and the Holy Spirit continues to counsel us, I think he will continue to give us wisdom. That's one of the things that I, the scripture makes it abundantly clear that the Lord wants us to ask him for. If you, if you feel like you lack wisdom, even if you feel like you have wisdom, ask him for more. And he delights to supply that. And with the wisdom that he supplies, I think that there'll be times where he gives you the opportunity to appeal to conscience because he's made you a person of conscience. But there's something else that Paul brings up here that also I, I just find immensely encouraging, even in just three short verses that we're looking at today. Because he also demonstrates the fact, even when we think about you know, how he grew bold as he grew older, I think what he demonstrates is that your faith in Christ will feed your desire to welcome others into the faith. Your faith in Christ is going to feed that desire to welcome others into the faith. The way he says it in verse 10 of, of this letter to Philemon, he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now, I'm going to explain what he means by that in just a second. But I'll tell you what, one of the most impactful experiences I have ever had was the opportunity to work at a Christian summer camp when I was in high school. That was one of the most impactful experiences I've ever had. I frequently tell people that it was in that context that I met the Lord. It was in that context that I was discipled to take my faith in Jesus Christ seriously it's also in that context that I first had the privilege to, to pray with someone as they came to faith in Jesus Christ. And even as I look around today, there are three people in the room right now that I had the opportunity to work with together as teenagers at that camp. Isn't that kind of cool? When you make good friends, you keep good friends, right? And in that context, it was, it was, that was one of the biggest and best experiences I ever had as a young person. And it was the first time I ever had, in that context, the opportunity to pray with someone as they came to faith in Christ. And I remember one particular evening, I remember a camper asking me to stick around with him after the chapel services had concluded because he wanted to talk to somebody about his life. He wanted to talk to somebody about his faith. He also wanted to talk to somebody about the fact that he had really become aware of his need for Jesus Christ in his life, but he wasn't sure what, what that would look like from that point on. And so after we spoke for a little while... I led him in a time of prayer, and he, in that time, he confessed his new faith in Christ, and he entrusted his life over to Christ. And then he left that chapel, and I sat there for just a minute, and I wasn't aware that there was anybody else in the room at that point, but then I heard a, a voice from the other side of the room and discovered that a newer staff member had been there the entire time. She had remained in the building to quietly pray. And she had heard everything that this camper had said to me and everything that I said to him. And then she saw him come to faith in Christ during that time. And I still remember her response as she stood up to walk out of the chapel. And she said, that was a powerful thing to witness. She said, that was a powerful thing to witness. It had an impact on her, even as she was looking on as a third party watching that. 
And it is a powerful thing to witness when you see somebody go from not being part of the family of God to becoming part of the family of God. In a sense, she witnessed a birth taking place. It is a powerful experience. It has a huge impact on your heart. It can't help. If you're a person of conscience who trusts in Jesus Christ, that can't help but have a huge impact on you. And I have, I have to admit that, that I never grow tired of telling people about Jesus, and I never grow tired of having the opportunity to pray with people as they come to faith in him. And every time, every time we have an opportunity to do that, if the Lord supplies that opportunity for you to do so, again, what you're seeing is you're given the opportunity to see the family of God grow. And when you lead someone to Christ in a very real sense, you become either their spiritual mother or their spiritual father. That's the role you take in their life, and it's not a small role. It's not an inconsequential role. It matters. And so when you look at what Paul says here, he says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. When Paul refers to Onesimus as his child in this passage, he's talking about that spiritual fatherhood. He mentions that he became a spiritual father to Onesimus during this imprisonment. During this imprisonment in Rome, he became his spiritual father. Paul had taken the time to, to share the gospel with this man. And keep in mind who Onesimus was. Onesimus had been a slave in Philemon's household, and he ran away from Philemon seeking his freedom. And by the way, if he got caught doing that, that's a capital offense. Philemon would have had the option to have him executed the Roman Empire wasn't kind to an escaped slave, and the law allowed Philemon to be able to execute Onesimus should he choose. But Onesimus fled Philemon's household. He fled Colossae. He goes to Rome. He's seeking his freedom. While he's in Rome, he ends up meeting the apostle Paul, and Paul leads him to faith in Christ. And imagine Paul learning the backstory of who Onesimus was and then realizing that he had also led the person who had owned Onesimus in the sense of being the slave owner, that he had also led him to faith in Christ as well, and realizing, wait a second, I see what the Lord's doing. This is an example of the sovereignty of God. This is an example of the providence of God. Because on multiple levels now, Philemon, who had been a slave owner, and Onesimus, who had been a slave, really shouldn't be looking at each other that way any longer or operating that way any longer because now on multiple levels, they're brothers in Christ, sharing the same Lord, Jesus Christ, sharing the same spiritual father in the apostle Paul. And I think as our faith in Christ matures, one of the things that you'll start to notice in your own heart, and I, I truly believe that the Lord will do this for you, I think you're going to see a desire to see more and more people added to the family of God. And you're going, to find yourself, you're going to find yourself with that as a high priority on your list. It's going to matter to you in your household, so you'll find yourself praying for your spouse. You'll find yourself praying for your children. You'll find yourself praying for your nieces and your nephews and your grandchildren and all the people that are part of your family. And then you'll find yourself praying for your friends, that they come to faith in Christ. Can I tell you, there's a place when we drive up to northeast Pennsylvania, getting uh, close to where I grew up, there's a place we pass on the way that a friend of mine from high school that I used to pray in, for in high school, um, I know he used to work at that place. And we pass it on the highway. And every time we pass it, I've committed to using that as a prompt to pray for my friend and his family that they would come to faith in Christ. And so on the way up when we pass it, I pray for this friend, pray for his family. On our way back when we pass it, I use it as a prompt. Oh, don't forget, pray for so-and-so. Pray for him, pray for his family, that they come to faith in Christ every time we pass. And then somewhere along the way, my family noticed that every time we passed that, I was praying. And finally, I just admitted to them what I was doing. And by the way, I was driving, so I kept my eyes open, I promise. But, I, uh, uh, but they noticed I just kind of got quiet. Normally, I'm a car singer, like when we're driving. It, it, it is kind of weird when all of a sudden, like the music's up loud and I'm singing my head off. Could you imagine if you had to spend a childhood like my children have had to spend where they're in that context. But then all of a sudden I go quiet. They're like, we know dad knows the words. Why is he quiet? It's like, I'm praying for my friend. I want him to come to know Jesus. And you find yourself, you pray for your family, you pray for your friends, but then it goes on from there. You start praying for your neighbors. Then you start praying for your coworkers. And I think one of the ultimate developments of this is that eventually you find yourself praying for people you don't even know. Just praying for people you don't even know. 
Because the one thing you do know about them is that they need Christ in their life. And you could testify to the difference that he's made in yours. And so you find yourself praying that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes to see and soften their hearts to receive. And then here's what happens next. Then in addition to praying, eventually you get a little bolder and you say, you know what? I'm going to be the one that tells them. I'm going to figure out a way to tell them. Even if I just, I may not convince them. I think it's the Holy Spirit that convinces people. But I'm at least going to be one seed of the gospel in their life. I'm going to find a way to say something. And I'm going to make sure that it's there. I had a conversation with somebody the other day. He called me up. And he said, could I just talk to you about something? This is not someone that shares our faith. But this is something, someone that I took the opportunity twice last year. Actually, yeah, both were last year. Uh, twice last year to share the gospel with as a friend, conversationally. And, uh, but I wasn't pushy about it. I just shared. I just asked him, what do you believe? And then I shared what I believe and didn't argue about it. I was like, all right, I've said what I've said. The Holy Spirit knows what to do with this. He's been saving people for a long time. But I know my job today is to plant a seed. And because of the way I handled that conversation the first time, you know what ended up happening? We had a follow-up conversation that he initiated. And I had the chance to share the gospel yet again. And then he called me the other day and he, and he just said to me, he said, I, I just want you to know, you're, you know, he said, I appreciate the fact that you never try and push anything on me. But he, he said, I, I just want you to know that I consider you a trusted friend. And so I just want to talk to you about this. And we talked about something. And I thought to myself, it's just interesting to watch how the Lord develops that unction in your heart where you just start getting bold. And after a while, you're like, the stuff I used to worry about and care about, I don't, I don't care about that stuff anymore. I'm just going to say something. And if somebody gets funny about it, okay, they're going to get funny with me about something, right? It's going to be something. Might as well just let it be because I took the initiative to actually share the gospel in one way or another. Didn't go through every last detail of everything ever in Scripture, but I did share the essence of the gospel with this friend two times. And I've been watching... When you look for those opportunities, the Lord keeps putting them right in front of you. And I remember when I was kind of taking an assessment of, of the past year, it dawned on me, and I mentioned this to my wife and a few other friends, I said, I have had more opportunities to share the gospel one-on-one -on -one with people this past year than I've ever had in my entire life. And it makes me wonder, maybe I haven't had more opportunities, maybe I'm just noticing them, maybe I've had the same amount of opportunities all along the way. It's just that now I'm starting to get bold. But I see that in the Apostle Paul's life. As he grew older, he got bolder. And he starts acting in this boldness not to strut, not to brag, not to confront just so he could puff his chest. He looks and he says, how can I introduce people to Jesus? And then how can I help people that, that have met Jesus to continue to grow in their faith? And he knew someone needed to step up and be bold. And so he chose to be bold. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot of things that I consider blessings about growing older. A lot of things I also consider challenges as well. But more blessings than challenges, I'll say that. But one of the greatest blessings that's come into my life over time, and I believe will come into your life over time, and I'm certain many of you can testify to this already, it's just that holy boldness that the Lord gives you when your conscience is clear, your faith is growing, your eyes begin seeing opportunities and circumstances through the eyes of Jesus Christ, and you start to see everything differently. And so as we finish up, let me just say this one sentence real quick, but I hope it sticks in our heart. Let Jesus make you bold for him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what you illustrate to us in this portion of Scripture and through the life of the Apostle Paul. Or we're grateful that as we work our way through this brief letter, that we have the opportunity to see how Paul was interacting with people and how he took his position of influence or his position of leadership, or even just his position as a member of the family of God, how he took it all seriously. He meets a man named Philemon, shares the gospel with him. Philemon becomes a believer. He meets Onesimus and shares the gospel with him. And Onesimus becomes a believer. And then he works to reconcile these men. He writes to encourage the church, and he writes to inspire us to take action. We just see all these things that you inspired him to do as your spirit guided his pen. 
and guided his mind to, to put these things down so that we could look at this. And Lord, we're obviously all at a, a, in the process of growing. All of us are. We are not in a glorified state yet. So all of us are still growing and maturing. And Lord, we pray that even with all the challenges that we experience as time goes on, we pray that we could also look at this and say, yeah, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also some really huge blessings and benefits. And one of the huge benefits, Lord, that you grant us as we walk with you longer and longer over time is you allow our faith to grow deeper. It grows stronger because you, we, we have watched as you have stood with us in the midst of all sorts of challenging seasons. And you prove yourself faithful over and over and over again. And then, Lord, we watch as you develop our wisdom as we look to your word for counsel and we rely on the guidance of your spirit through prayer. And you help us to grow in wisdom. And then, Lord, as our faith grows, and as we grow in wisdom, you make us bold. And there are people's lives that are directly impacted because of the work that you're doing in our individual lives. So, Lord, we're thankful that that's a process that you're bringing us through, and that's a process you certainly brought the Apostle Paul through, but I think you also did this for Philemon, and I think you also did this for Onesimus as well. I even think the fact that Onesimus was willing to, to bring this letter back to Philemon, that was, a, that was an action of bold faith. He could have been executed when doing so, and yet he chose to do it. And this letter reached Philemon. And so, Lord, we're just so thankful for these examples that you've given to us, and we're grateful for your presence with us now. By your grace, we pray that we would walk with you faithfully and that we would continue to rejoice in the new life that we have through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the love that you've shown us first. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to participate in communion together. And uh, before we do, I'd just like to invite us to, to just spend a moment just in silent prayer. If there's anything we need to bring before the Lord to confess, if there's anything we need to bring before the Lord in repentance or anything like that, prior to partaking of communion, that's a wise time to do so. And so let's just pause and silently pray, and, and then I'll lead us in prayer before we partake in communion together. Let's pray silently. Lord, we come before you and we confess what we're wrestling with. We confess what we're struggling with. We confess the mistakes and acts of rebellion that we find in our lives. We confess our immaturity and our need for growth. And we thank you for the work that's been accomplished on our behalf to restore us, to make us brand new in your son, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the work of his sinless life and his atoning death, and his resurrection from the grave, offering us new life, offering us forgiveness through faith in him. So Lord, we pray that as we partake of communion now, that the work that your son Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf to bring us into your family, to forgive us of sin, and to unite us together as one family, we pray that that would all be freshly on our minds, and that we would give you thanks for it. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.